In Module 6.1, Skeletal System Functions, we introduce the five most important functions of the skeletal system. In Module 6.2, we will learn how bones can be classified by anatomical features. In particular, how the shape and structure of bone can be used in categorizing bones. We will also compare and contrast compact bone from spongy bone. Let's begin now. You may or may not recall from Module 4.4 that bone tissue, also called osseous tissue, is a supporting connective tissue. Like all connective tissues, bone tissue is made of a sparse number of cells found in an abundant extracellular matrix. Recall again with connected tissues that the extracellular matrix has two main components, namely their ground substance and protein fibers. Both of these components are made by the cells. Unlike connective tissue proper, which has a wide variety of cell types, there are only a few types of cells found in bone tissue. So let's consider the nature of these three components when it comes to bone tissue, namely the types of cells, the nature of their ground substance, and the types of protein fibers found therein. When it comes to the cells, the primary cell of mature bone tissue is called an osteocyte. There are a couple other cell types commonly found in bones, but osteocytes are the main type of cell found in bone tissue. Next, the extracellular matrix is made of a ground substance called osteoid. It's produced by bone cells initially in a gelatin-like fashion. It soon ossifies and hardens. It ossifies because of calcification. That is, the primary salts involved in ossification are calcium and phosphate collectively called hydroxyapatite. Finally, the protein fibers that are most abundant in bone matrix are collagen fibers. If we were to take a specific bone of the human body and to break it down into these three components, we would find that between 60 to 70 percent of the bone is made of calcium salts in the form of calcium phosphate. The remaining 30% or so is made from the protein fibers, collagen. Only about 2% of a bone is actually made of bone cells, osteocytes, and or one of the other types of bone cells found in bone tissue. The typical human skeleton contains around 206 major bones. They have four general shapes. We have long bones, which are longer than they are wide. We have short bones, which are about as wide as they are long. Flat bones, which are thin and relatively broad. And irregular bones, which have complex shapes that really don't fit into one of the aforementioned categories. Examples of long bones are the limbs, such as the bones of the arm, humerus, as depicted here and or femur of the thigh. Examples of short bones include the bones of the wrist, that is, the carpal bones. The bones of the ankles, the tarsal bones, are similar. Examples of flat bones include the parietal bones of the skull. Other flat bones include the ribs or costals and the shoulder blades, the scapulae. Examples of irregular bones include the vertebrae of the spinal column and several bones of the skull. For the purpose of describing the various components of a bone, we will use a long bone, like that of the humerus, to illustrate. Not all bones have all of these features. Nevertheless, a long bone serves well to illustrate these components. The major regions of the long bone are the diaphysis and the epiphyses. There's not always two epiphyses, but often there is. The diaphysis is the central shaft of the long bone. It surrounds what we call a marrow cavity. Sometimes this is called a medullary cavity or a medullary cavity. 
or a medullary cavity. All three pronunciations are correct. The epiphysis is the expanded end of a bone. Thus, many long bones have two epiphyses, the expanded portions at each end. These are often covered with articular cartilage. Now, articular cartilage is called such because it's found at the end of a long bone which articulates or forms a joint with another bone. Articular cartilage is actually made of hyaline cartilage, the most common type of cartilage in the human body. The articular cartilage that remains at the end of a long bone is simply a remnant of the original cartilage that the bone was formed in during development. Here in figure 6.2, we see an illustration of the structure of a long bone and its parts. A long bone has a central shaft. Again, this is the diaphysis. That surrounds a central space called the marrow cavity or medullary cavity or medullary cavity. The marrow space contains soft bone marrow, often fatty tissue. The expanded portion at each end are called the epiphyses. Thus, we have a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis in this case. They are covered by what is shown in blue as articular cartilage. Again, articular cartilage is just made of hyaline cartilage, and it's a remnant of the original cartilage that this long bone was formed in during development. Notice also two other structures labeled here, namely the periosteum, Peri means around, and so this is a fibrous layer around the bone, just like we have fibrous tissue around cartilage called perichondrium. We also have endosteum, which is the lining of the hollow marrow cavity at the core of the diaphysis. Let's discuss the periosteum first. Please notice that the periosteum has two layers, a fibrous layer, and a cellular layer. Thus, the outer surface of a bone is covered by a periosteum. The periosteum consists of an inner cellular layer and an outer fibrous layer. The fibers of tendons and ligaments that fuse with a bone intermingle with those of the fibrous layer of the periosteum. Tendons attach skeletal muscles to bones, and ligaments attach one bone to another. The periosteum isolates the bone from surrounding tissues and provides a route for blood vessels and nerves and takes part in bone growth and repair. In particular, the inner cellular layer assists in bone growth. Thus, we see the inner cellular layer contains stem cells that can mature into osteoblasts that can give rise to new bone matrix being deposited. This leads to bone growth in diameter. The inner surface and spongy bone marrow cavity is covered by an endosteum. This functions during bone growth and repair. Within the bone, a cellular endosteum covers the spongy bone of the marrow cavity and other inner surfaces. The endosteum is active during bone growth and during repair or remodeling. Returning to the previous slide, you can see that it is lining the inside marrow cavity. In an upcoming slide, we'll have a better look at the endosteum. In a cross-section of a long bone, two types of bone tissue are evident. There is an outer compact bone, sometimes called dense bone, which is relatively dense and solid. At the core and within the epiphyses, we find spongy bone, also called cancellous bone, or trabecular bone because of the struts and trabeculae that are found there. Thus, compact bone forms the wall of the diaphysis, and spongy bone fills the epiphyses and lines the marrow cavity. A thin layer of compact bone covers the spongy bone of each epiphysis. As stated at the outset, bone is a supporting connective tissue. Both compact bone and spongy bone contain bone cells, or osteocytes. These are the most common cell type found in bone. During development, they become entrapped in little pockets or small indentations called lacunae as the osteoid calcifies around them. They are laid down in concentric rings called lamellae. 
These rings appear almost like the rings on a target around a bullseye, which would be the center of the smallest functional unit of bone called the osteon. At the very core, there is a central canal with blood vessels. Looking more closely at this structure, these rings are evident. We can also see the osteocytes trapped in their lacunae, marked by these dark spots on the micrograph. Also evident are these spiderweb-like structures reaching out from the cells. These are actually cytoplasmic extensions of the osteocytes as they reach from their entrapment toward blood vessels of the central canal and also toward one another. As osteoid hardens around these cytoplasmic extensions, these miniature canals called canaliculi allow the cells to communicate with one another, to receive gases and nutrients from the central canal, and to send waste products back there too. We'll return to this image in a moment. Thus, the basic functional unit of compact bone is called an osteon. Traditionally, it's been called the Herversion system. Again, Herversion is an example of an eponym, a structure that is named after a scientist that discovered it. Within a Herversion system, or an osteon, the osteocytes again are arranged in concentric layers called lamellae. These lamellae, or rings, surround a central canal, or a haversion canal. Central canals run parallel to the surface of the bone and contain blood vessels. Also, penetrating from the central canal, perpendicular to the osteon, are perforating canals. These sometimes have the name of Volkmann's canals. Again, this is an example of an eponym. As you can see these structures on the next image, there are numerous osteons found within the peripheral layers of compact bone in a long bone. Here you can see a cutaway of several osteons and their length parallel to the surface of the long bone. Also evident are the blood vessels found in the central canals of each osteon. Moreover, the Volkmann's canals named after the German physiologist Alfred Volkmann, are seen here penetrating from a central canal to the bone marrow and also communicating from one osteon to the next and from one osteon to the periosteum which surrounds the bone. This way, blood can be moved into the bone tissue and delivered to the osteocytes to nourish them and to collect waste and return that back to the body's systems. Also evident in this image, is the inner lining of endosteum found along the bone marrow. Furthermore, the trabeculae or struts of spongy bone are clearly demonstrated in this image. Let's further compare compact bone to spongy bone. A layer of compact bone covers bone surfaces everywhere except inside joint capsules. That is where we have articular cartilages that protect opposing surfaces. Compact bone is usually found where stresses come from a limited range of directions. The limb bones, for example, are built to withstand forces applied at either end, such as when you stand and put pressure down on the long bone of your femur. Because osteons are parallel to the long axis of the shaft, a limb bone does not bend when a force, even a large one, is applied to either end. However, a much smaller force applied to the side of the shaft can break the bone. That is, the compact bone cannot tolerate even moderate stress when applied to the side of the diaphysis. Spongy bone, on the other hand, has no osteons, and it has a different arrangement of its lamellae. Its lamellae form rods, or plates, called trabeculae. Frequent branchings of the thin trabeculae create an open network. Canaliculi, radiating from the lacunae of spongy bone, end at the exposed surfaces of the trabeculae where nutrients and waste diffuse between the marrow and the osteocytes. In contrast to compact bone, spongy bone is found where bones are not heavily stressed or where the stresses that do arrive arrive from many directions. For example, spongy bone is present in the epiphyses of long bones, where stresses are transferred across joints. 
is also much lighter than compact bone. Spongy bone reduces the weight of the skeleton, making it easier for muscles to move the bones. Finally, the trabecular network of spongy bone supports and protects the cells of red bone marrow, where blood cells are formed. Returning for a moment to the topic of bone cells, there are three major types of cells found in bone tissue, namely osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts are young bone cells that produce new bone matrix through a process called ossification. Osteoblasts that get surrounded by their own bony matrix, which then calcifies and hardens, become entrapped in osteoid. They then mature into osteocytes. Thus, osteocytes, the most abundant cells in bone, are mature cells that maintain bone structure. They are able to produce new bone matrix and they are able to recycle existing bone matrix. Osteoblasts thus develop into osteocytes. Osteoclasts, on the other hand, actually come from a completely different line or lineage of cells. They actually derive from monocytes. Many monocytes fuse together to form an osteoclast. Thus, these large cells sometimes have more than 50 nuclei found within them, representing the original monocytes that fuse together to form these cells. These cells secrete acids and enzymes that dissolve the matrix of the bone marrow. The process of breaking down bone marrow releases the contents of the bone marrow, such as calcium and phosphate, which can then move into the blood. This process of releasing minerals from bone matrix is called resorption. You may come across another type of bone cell similar to osteoclasts called odontoclasts. Those of you that are interested in becoming a dental hygienist or working in dentistry may see this term. An odontoclast is simply an osteoclast that's associated with absorption of the roots of deciduous teeth. Here on this slide, we can see all three cell types pictured and the relation to where they're typically found in bone. Osteoblasts are often found in that cellular layer of the periosteum. They lay down new bone matrix shown here in blue, which then ossifies and calcifies and hardens around the cells, entrapping them, and they mature into osteocytes. Osteocytes, which are entrapped in their own osteoid, produce these cytoplasmic extensions, shown here in pink, and as the bone matrix hardens around them, these living projections can still communicate with neighboring osteocytes to deliver nutrients and waste products and to communicate with one another. Finally, the osteoclast, again derived from monocytes, is a large cell, as you can see depicted here with numerous nuclei, representing the cells that have fused together to make this cell. You can also see that its surface is highly folded, which increases surface area for secreting acids and enzymes that degrade the bone matrix lining the bone marrow such that the minerals can be resorbed and used and delivered to the circulatory system. Thus, we come to the end of Module 6.2. Having completed Module 6.2, Take some time and reflect on the questions left here for you from the authors of the textbook.